Alrighty, gang. Last time we talked about limits and introduced the new L'Hopital's rule as a method for computing limits. This time, we want to take that idea a little bit farther and come up with a foolproof attack for computing the limits. Let's say we wanted to work on this problem right here. Compute the limit as x tended to some value a of some function f of x. And right now, let's assume that this f of x is an elementary function. So that just means it's something who's built out of the basic pieces, power functions, trigonometric functions, inverse trigonometric functions, logarithms, and exponentials. Well, the basic process that we've used since Calc 1 was sort of a, a multi-step process. The first step was to plug in x equals a formally. The second step was to sort of interpret that result. Often, we would get things like 3 over 7, which we knew was a number. If we got a real number, we called that the limit. Other times, we would get things like 0 over 0, or infinity over infinity, which were formulas that we called indeterminate. In Calc 1, these guys told us that we couldn't detect what the limit was based solely on the information we had, but we needed to do a rewrite of the function. Other times, we would get expressions like, say, 7 over 0, or 7 over infinity. Neither one of these things is a real number. Right? We're not allowed to divide by 0, and infinity isn't even a number at all right here. But we did sort of know how to interpret these things. When 7 over infinity popped up as a limit, we interpreted this as the number 0. If, on the other hand, we got 7 over 0, we interpreted this as saying that the function value was becoming very, very big or very, very large because we were at a vertical asymptote. So these guys right here are what are known as determinant forms. A lot of the trick in Calc 1 was recognizing the determinant ones from the indeterminate ones. The third step in the process was if we were given an indeterminate form, we had to rewrite the integral. Sorry, rewrite the limit function. And this could be a bit tricky in Calc 1. That usually meant factoring or canceling. Sometimes it meant multiplying by the conjugate. Sometimes it meant pulling out an obscure trig fact. Or, as we saw yesterday, we could use the L'Hopital rewrite. So what I, we want to do today is I want to sort of focus on these two steps right here. I'd like to give you guys a list of which one of these forms are indeterminate, which one of these forms are determinate. And then, given the indeterminate forms, give suggestions for useful rewrites. So based on our work in Calc 1, we've seen that there are two common, what are called improper forms, expressions that are not real numbers but occur in the limit, the first step of the limit process, that we call indeterminate. And those are 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. We know from Calc 1 that if we see an indeterminate form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, we can't make any statement at all about what the limiting value is. On the other hand, we're trained to recognize a couple of determinate forms. For example, if we have a non-zero number over infinity, which often happens when we're, say, trying to compute a horizontal asymptote limit, then we know that this particular value right here can always be interpreted as zero. The idea is that we're taking a fixed number and we're dividing by a larger and larger and larger number. So I'm sort of thinking of fixed number over very, very large. That should be very, very small. And if I take it to the limit, as this becomes infinitely large, this becomes infinitely small. And so that's sort of our interpretation. Similarly, if we have a non-zero number and we divide by zero, we know from Calc 1 that this event only occurs at an asymptote. Essentially, if we take a fixed number and we divide by something very, very small, then we're going to get something which is very, very large. It would be helpful if I could spell that correctly. We're going to get something who's very, very large. Now, we might be tempted to say that a number divided by zero, then, is infinity. But it's worth pointing out that if it's a small positive number, you're going to get a large positive value. If you take a, f a fixed value and divide by something small but negative, you're going to get a very large negative value. So kind of the best I can say here is that if you take a fixed number and divide by zero 
the limiting value is going to be very, very large in positive or very, very small in positive. What other things can we have out here? What if I gave you, for example, e to the infinity? That's not a real number in the sense that infinity isn't something you're technically allowed to plug in, but could we make sense out of this? I mean, what we want to do is we want to think of this as we're going to take e and we're going to raise it to very, very large powers. Now we know what the basic shape of this function is. As the values get larger and larger and larger, e will get larger and larger and larger. So it seems to make sense that e raised to the infinite power should be an infinite value. And that would suggest it belongs over here in the determinant form camp, e to the infinity. And it does. On the other hand, what about e to the negative infinity? Well, there's a couple of ways we could argue this. e to the negative infinity should be e to the infinity. And we've just said that e to the infinity is infinity, so that would be 1 over infinity. But according to the top line, a number over infinity is 0. So it makes sense that e to the negative infinity should be 0. Alternatively, we could look at this graph, and as I go farther and farther and farther to the right, as x becomes closer and closer to negative infinity, the graph is becoming closer and closer to zero. So it seems as though e to the negative infinity is zero, is another determinant form. What about zero times infinity? So the idea here is we're thinking of taking a very, very small number times a very, very large number. A lot of times people say that zero times infinity ought to be zero. Because zero times anything is zero. Unfortunately, that argument doesn't quite work. Because if zero times infinity was always equal to zero, well, remember that zero is the same thing as one over infinity. So I'd have one over infinity times infinity. That's the same as one over infinity times infinity over one. And that would be infinity over infinity. So if 0 times infinity was 0, then infinity over infinity would always have to be 0. But that violates what we know from Calc 1, that infinity over infinity is not always 0. It's indeterminate. So since 0 over 0 can be algebraically rewritten as infinity over infinity, sorry, 0 times infinity can be rewritten as infinity over infinity, we're going to have to conclude that 0 times infinity must be indeterminate as well. And so we're going to have to move it over on this side of the chart. What about infinity minus infinity? In other words, we're going to take a really, really large number, and we're going to subtract a really, really large number. Well, the usual gut response on this is that this should also be 0. Because, well, infinity minus infinity. x minus x is 0. 2 minus 2 is 0. Shouldn't infinity minus infinity be 0? However, if infinity minus infinity were 0, Let's go back a step. Take 0 times infinity and apply the natural logarithm to it. The rules of LNs would say that this should be LN of 0 plus LN of infinity. Now, what are these values right here? LN of infinity, if you plug a larger and larger value into the logarithm, let's make a quick sketch of LN of x. It's shaped like this. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the logarithm gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So LN of infinity is infinity. On the other hand, ln of 0, well, as the input values get closer and closer to 0, then the output values on the logarithm graph are becoming more and more negative. So ln of 0 is negative infinity. So ln of 0 times infinity is negative infinity plus infinity, or if you'd like, infinity minus infinity. If we could assign a value to negative infinity minus infinity, then we should be able to assign a value to 0 times infinity. But we know that 0 times infinity is indeterminate because we saw that 0 times infinity could be algebraically rewritten as infinity over infinity. And so, put all that together, that tells me that this guy, infinity minus infinity, can't be assigned a determinate value because 0 times infinity can't be assigned a determinate value, and so on and so on back. And so what we conclude is that infinity minus infinity also belongs in the indeterminate form. Now, what I'm trying to get across right here is the idea that it's sometimes hard at a glance to distinguish the determinate forms from the indeterminate forms. We've got four determinate forms over here. Actually, there's two more we could add to this list. ln of infinity is infinity, and ln of 0 is minus infinity, based on the argument we just did. On the other hand, if I gave you something like 1 to the infinity, 
or infinity to the one, or zero to the zero, or zero to the infinity, or infinity to the zero, which one of these things would be determinant or not? Most people would say that one to the infinity ought to be one, since one raised to anything is one, that infinity to the one ought to be infinity, that zero to the zero ought to be one, since anything to the zeroth power is one, that zero to the infinity ought to be zero, and that infinity to the zero ought to be one, since anything to the zeroth power is zero, or sorry, is, is one. Unfortunately, these are not all true. It turns out that this formula and this formula are correct. Infinity raised to a power, a positive power if you'd like, is going to be in infinity, and zero raised to the infinite power is going to be zero. But the other three are indeterminate. And the reason why each one of these three guys are indeterminate is because, well, let's focus on, say, 1 to the infinity, which is one that people vociferously really, really, really want to equal 1. If 1 to the infinity had the definite value of 1, then we could take ln on both sides. So ln of 1 to the infinity would be ln of 1. Now, using the usual rules of exponents, I'd pull the infinity out. I'd have infinity times ln of 1 would equal ln of 1, which is 0. But wait! ln of 1 is 0 as well, so I'd have 0 times infinity equals 0. If 1 to the infinity had the definite value 1, then 0 times infinity would have the definite value 0. But that contradicts the fact that we've shown that 0 times infinity is indeterminate. It's indeterminate because infinity over infinity is indeterminate. And infinity over infinity is indeterminate because that's what Calc 1 taught us. And in fact, the same argument works for these other three guys, just sort of apply quote-unquote ln to them, and you'll keep coming back to zero times infinity. So one to the infinity, zero to the zero, and zero, infinity to the zero now belong in the indeterminate form camp. So imagine I were to give you something else. Again, the point of these examples has been to show you that it's hard to distinguish between the determinant forms and the indeterminate forms. That's the bad news, is that there are a lot more indeterminate forms than we were told in Calc 1. Here's the good news. These are the only seven indeterminate forms out there. Zero over zero, infinity over infinity, zero times infinity, infinity minus infinity, one to the infinity, zero to the zero, and infinity to the zero. Anything else that we might come across has to belong to the determinant form side and can be figured out by sort of graphing things or doing some basic intuitive arguments. I've spaced the indeterminate forms like this for a reason. Although most books don't really use this language right here, I'm actually going to go and subdivide these indeterminate forms into three classes. The two guys on the top right here we're going to call type A indeterminate forms. The two in the middle row we're going to call type B indeterminate forms and the three on the bottom row we're going to call type C indeterminate forms. And the reason why I'm going to name them this way is that each type of indeterminate form has a specific rewrite that can be used to help us evaluate limits. And so that's what we want to spend the rest of the time talking about. There are two type A indeterminate forms, zero over zero and infinity over infinity. The two basic indeterminate forms from Calc 1. Whenever we come across one of these guys, our basic line of attack is going to be to use L'Hopital's rule. So remember that L'Hopital's rule essentially says this. If a limit is type A indeterminate, in other words, you get a 0 over 0 or an infinity over infinity, then the rewrite of the limit, the limit as x tends to A of f of x over g of x, this limit can be rewritten by taking the numerator and replacing it with the de uh, derivative, and taking the denominator and replacing it with the derivative. Technically, the, there is an addendum that I didn't mention yesterday, and the addendum is, provided the second limit, the latter limit, is real, or diverges to plus infinity, or diverges to minus infinity. In practice, if, this, if we use L'Hopital's rule, and we get a real value at the end of this limit, then L'Hopital's rule is retroactively justified. So let's take a look at a couple of examples that involve type A indeterminate forms.
Let's compute the limit as x tends to 0 of cosine x plus 2x minus 1 over 3x. The limit as x tends to 0 of e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, all over cosine of 2x. And the limit as x tends to infinity of ln of x over the square root of x. So let's first focus on this guy right here. We've got the limit as x tends to 0 of the cosine of x plus 2x minus 1 over 3x. Now, if we just formally plug in 0, we're going to get cosine of 0 plus 2 times 0 minus 1 all over 3 times 0. Since cosine of 0 is 1, we're going to get 0 in the numerator and 0 in the denominator. This is a type A indeterminate form, and that means that we can apply L'Hopital's rule. So if I use L'Hopital's rule, we're going to rewrite this limit by replacing the numerator with the derivative of the numerator. So we're going to have negative sine of x plus 2 minus 0, if you'd like. And we're going to replace the denominator with the derivative of the denominator, which is 3. If I clean this up a little bit, this is the limit as x tends to 0 of negative sine of x plus 2 over 3. I have a brand new limit, and so I can restart the entire process over again. Starting with this brand new limit, let's plug in x equals 0. We're going to get negative sine of 0 plus 2 all over 3. Since the sine of 0 is 0, this is going to be the number 2 thirds. Since 2 thirds is a real value, then we know that this is the limit. And tracing our equalities back, we've just worked out that the limit as x tends to 0 of cosine x plus 2x minus 1 over 3x is 2 thirds. And so the first limit is taken care of. Now let's focus on the second limit right here. We have the limit as x tends to 0 of e to the x plus e to the negative x minus 2 all over 1 minus the cosine of 2x. Now if we formally plug in 0, we're going to have e to the 0 plus e to the negative 0 minus 2 all over 1 minus the cosine of 2, 0. So that would be 1 plus 1 minus 2 over 1 minus 1, or 0 over 0. So this is now type A indeterminate. Since it's type A indeterminate, my general attack is going to be to use L'Hopital's rule. So we'll rewrite the limit and we're going to replace the numerator with the derivative of the numerator and the denominator with the derivative of the denominator. So the derivative of e to the x plus e to the negative x minus 2, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the derivative of, ne of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x, and the derivative of 2 is 0. If we take the derivative on the bottom, the derivative of 1 is 0, the derivative of negative cosine of 2x is negative negative sine of 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is 2. So let me clean this up. We're going to have the limit as x tends to 0 of e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2 times the sine of 2x. We have a brand new limit. We start our limiting process again. Let's formally plug in x equals 0. That gets me e to the 0 minus e to the negative 0 over 2 times the sine of 0. So that's going to be 1 minus 1 on the top and 2 times 0 on the bottom. That gets me 0 over 0. And that means we still have a type A indeterminate form. That means we can apply L'Hopital's rule yet again. If we apply L'Hopital's rule one more time, the limit as x tends to 0, we'll replace the top with the derivative of the top and the bottom with the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the top, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, minus the derivative of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x. On the bottom we had there it is right there, 2 sine 2x. So the derivative of 2 sine 2x is going to be 2 times the cosine of 2x times the derivative of 2x, which is 2, using the chain rule. And so if I clean that up, that's the limit as x tends to 0 of e to the x plus e to the negative x all over 4 times the cosine of 2x. Brand new limit, let's plug stuff in. We'll plug in x equals 0, e to the 0 plus e to the 0 over 4 times cosine of 0. That will get us 1 plus 1 in the numerator and 4 times 1 in the denominator, or 2 fourths, which simplifies to 1 half. Since this is a real number, it must be the limit. And so tracing our equalities back, we find that the limit of e to the x plus e to the negative x minus 2 over 1 minus cosine of 2x is 1 half. And we have the second limit taken care of.
Finally, let's focus on the limit as x tends to infinity of ln of x over the square root of x. This is the limit as x tends to infinity. Let me prep it a little bit. We have ln of x over x to the 1 half power. Now, if we go and be formally plug in, we're going to have ln of infinity over infinity to the 1 half power. Now, let me take this a little bit slow and careful. The numerator up here, ln of infinity, we saw already, that can be simplified as infinity. That's a determinant form. On the other hand, infinity to the 1 half power, we saw that infinity to the 0 was indeterminate. Everything else is determinate, so we should be able to work this out. What does this mean? This means, as scratch work on the side, we're taking a large number, and then we're taking the square root of it. So as the number gets larger, the square root gets larger. And so infinity to the 1 half power should still be infinity. So ln of infinity over infinity to the 1 half power is an infinity over infinity. This is still a type B indeterminate form, and so this means we can use L'Hopital's rule. Now when I was a student, my calculus teacher would always say, instead of, let us apply L'Hopital's rule, which was wonderfully formal, he'd say, let's hit it with the L'Hopital stick. And we draw a bat smacking the integral right here. This is non-standard form, but I find that Calc 2 students enjoy nothing more than trying physical act of violence against their calculus problems, and so I'm more than happy if you want to go and draw L'Hopital sticks beating up, your or beating up your limits. So let's apply L'Hopital's rule. So if we take a swack at it with the L'Hopital stick, we take the top and replace it with the derivative of the top, which is x to the minus 1, and we take the bottom and replace it with the derivative of the bottom, which is 1 half x to the minus 1 half power. So there are my derivatives. Now, in any derivative problem, we ought to clean things up here a little bit. Let's see if we can simplify this. This is equal to, let's see what we have here. We have 1 over x on the top. And then on the bottom, we have 1 over 2 times x to the 1 half power. So if I clean that up a little bit more, this is the limit as x tends to infinity of 1 over x times 2x to the 1 half power over 1. Square root of x goes into x, square root of x times, and so this can be simplified as the limit as x tends to infinity of 2 over x to the 1 half power. If you're going to use L'Hopital's rule, you really ought to clean up your fractions. I mean, that's really part of our derivative process anyway. So now I have my new improved limit. We start the process over again. Let's let x tend off to infinity formally. We're going to get 2 over infinity to the 1 half power. Now, based on the work we did above here, we know that infinity to the 1 half power is an infinity. So this is 2 over infinity. 2 over infinity is not one of our seven indeterminate forms. In fact, from Calc 1, we know that a number over infinity tends to 0. Since 0 is a real number, it means that this limit was justified. And if we follow our equal signs all the way back, we see that the limit as x tends to infinity of ln of x over x to the 1 half is 0. And so we've worked out these three type A indeter indeterminate form examples. Let's take a look at this one sort of specific limit example right here. It's an example of a type A indeterminate form that requires an additional bit of trickery. So if we had the limit as x tends to infinity of the square root of x squared plus 3 over x, if we formally plug in, we would get the square root of infinity squared plus 3 over infinity. Now, infinity squared plus 3, that's a really, really huge number. That's going to be the square root of an infinity over an infinity, and the square root of an infinity is an infinity. So this would get me infinity over infinity. This is a type A indeterminate form, and that means we can hit it with the L'Hopital stick. So let me prep this really, really quickly. And with the magic of computers, I don't need to rewrite anything. And now let's take the limit using L'Hopital's rule. So what we'll do is we'll take the top and replace the top with the derivative of the top. That would be 1 half times x squared plus 3 to the negative 1 half power times the derivative of the top, which is 2x. And we'll replace the bottom with the derivative of the bottom, which is 1. So now let's clean this thing up here. I don't really have to worry about the bottom at all. And the 1 half and the 2 cancel. And lastly, this piece really belongs in the denominator. So if I clean this up, I'm going to have the limit as x tends to infinity of x over x squared plus 3 to the 1 half power. Alrighty. Now if we plug in x going to infinity, we're going to get an infinity on the top. 
we're going to have an infinity squared plus 3 to the 1 half power on the bottom, and that's going to be an infinity over an infinity based on what we did before. So this is still type A indeterminate. And that means I can hit it with the L'Hopital stick. So if we hit it with the L'Hopital stick again, the derivative of the top is 1, the derivative of the bottom is 1 half times x squared plus 3 to the negative 1 half power times the derivative of the inside which is 2x. So the 2 and the 1 half cancel, this piece belongs in the other side of the fraction bar, and so when I clean it up I get the limit as x tends to infinity of x squared plus 3 to the 1 half power over x. And unfortunately we're right back where we started. If we apply L'Hopital's rule over and over again, we're just going to keep cycling back and forth right here. So, is there any other way around this particular problem? Well, it turns out that there is, although it's going to require a little bit of algebraic finagling. So those tricks that we learned in Calc 1 about rewriting something algebraically, all right, last time I gave you the idea that L'Hopital's rule rendered them all completely obsolete. That's not 100% true. Those rules are still useful. I'm going to do a little bit of a rewrite on this one. I'm going to rewrite this as, on the bottom, x squared to the 1 half power. So that I can rewrite this as the limit as x tends to infinity of x squared plus 3 over x squared to the 1 half power. Now by writing it like this, what I see here is I've got a nice ordinary limit on the inside, x squared plus 3 over x squared, and I'm composing this with the function x squared. Since the square root function is continuous, one of the rules we learned in Calc 1 is that we can pass a limit inside of a continuous function. The limit is x tends to infinity of x squared plus 3 over x squared. This limit can be brought inside the square root. Now that we're inside the square root, well, let me sort of focus my attention on just this bit right here. We have the limit is x tends to infinity of x squared plus 3 over x squared. If I plug in x going off to infinity, we're going to have infinity squared plus 3 over an infinity squared. That would be an infinity over infinity, which is type A indeterminate. So I can hit this limit with the L'Hopital stick. When I do that, that's going to come out to being the limit as x tends to infinity. We'll replace the top with the derivative of the top, 2x. We'll replace the bottom with the derivative of the bottom, 2x. Everything cancels, and so this becomes the limit as x tends to infinity of 1. And that value is 1. But this value right here is the limit inside these parentheses. So we've just shown that this limit is equal to the function square root evaluated at the limiting value 1. But the square root of 1 is 1. And so we found this limiting value. This trick of rewriting a function and then slipping the limit inside the parentheses of a continuous function is one of the tools we use in Calc 1. And it's actually an important tool here in Calc, in Calc 2. And we're going to see it a little bit more when we get to the type C indeterminate forms. But first, let's talk about the type Bs. Now, when we made our list of the indeterminate forms, I identified two of them as being type B indeterminate forms. And those two type B indeterminate forms are 0 times infinity and infinity minus infinity. Why we lump these two indeterminate forms together is their basic plan of attack. And that basic attack is to rewrite the limiting function as a single fraction. The basic idea of this is if you can rewrite it as a single fraction f of x over g of x, then when you take the limit of something like this, it's either going to be a determinant form, or it'll be a 0 over 0, or an infinity over infinity. And so the whole idea of this process is that by rewriting it as a, a single fraction, we can turn this into a type A problem. And on a type A problem, we use L'Hopital's rule. So the best way to see this is to put it into practice. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Let's take a look at the following three examples. 
Compute the limit as x tends to infinity of x squared e to the negative 3x. The limit as x tends to infinity of x times ln of 1 plus c over x, where c is a constant. And the limit as x tends to 0 from the right of 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus e to the 1 over x. So let's take a look at this first guy right here. The limit as x tends to infinity of x squared e to the negative 3x. Now if we go and do the formal plug-in, we're going to get infinity squared times e to the minus 3 times infinity. And let's just take these things nice and slow. This is, in some sense, the most important part in the limit process is working these things out. Infinity squared. The only indeterminate form that has an infinity to a power is infinity to the 0, which is indeterminate. So that means that infinity squared we should be able to work out by hand. If we take a really big number and we square it, we get a really, really big number. So infinity squared ought to be infinity. Same argument over here. This is going to be e raised to a really big negative power. But e raised to a really large negative power, we already said was equal to zero. And so what we found out is that the limit as x tends to infinity upon formally plugging in infinity becomes infinity times zero. And that's one of our two type B indeterminate forms, zero times infinity. So the basic line of attack is I need to rewrite this guy by turning it into a fraction. In this case, it's probably pretty obvious how to do that. We have an e to the negative 3x. That part, algebraically, belongs in a denominator anyway. Now, by re rewriting it like this, we have a single fraction. So let's go through and formally plug in again. If we plug in here, we're going to get an infinity squared over e to the 3 times infinity. Well, infinity squared, we argued, was infinity. And e to the 3 infinity, that's e to a huge number, or infinity. So we're getting infinity over infinity. Infinity over infinity, though, is type A indeterminate. And the nice thing about type A indeterminate forms is that they can be hit with the L'Hopital stick. So if we thwack this with the L'Hopital stick, we'll replace the top by the derivative of the top, that's 2x, and we'll replace the bottom by the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of e to the 3x is 3e to the 3x. And now we can repeat the process. So the limit as x tends to infinity. Let's plug in infinity formally. So we have 2 times infinity on top, 3 times e to the 3 times infinity on the bottom. Well, 2 times a really, really big number is a really, really big number. And we've already said that e to the 3 infinity is an infinity. So we get an infinity over an infinity. That's still type A indeterminate, which means we can hit it once again with the L'Hopital stick. So we take another swack at it. We're going to get the limit as x tends to infinity. We replace the top by the derivative of the top, which is 2. We replace the bottom with the derivative of the bottom, which is now 9 e to the 3x. And we formally plug in again. On top, we're going to get 2. On the bottom, we're going to get 9 times e to the 3 times infinity, or 2 over infinity. This is not indeterminate form. A number divided by infinity is equal to 0 as the limit. Since this is a real number, it means this equality was justified. In tracing back our equal signs, we've shown that the limit as x tends to infinity of x squared e to the negative 3x is 0. And the first limit is taken care of. Now let's focus on the second limit. The limit as x tends to infinity of x times ln of 1 plus c times x to the minus 1. I'm already prepping it just thinking ahead as a calculus problem. So if I were to formally plug in infinity, we're going to get infinity times ln of 1 plus c times infinity to the minus 1. And so let's carefully work our way through this. Inside these parentheses here, let's see, infinity to the minus 1. The only infinity to a power whose indeterminate is infinity to the 0, so that means we should be able to work this guy out by common sense. This is the reciprocal of a really, really big number. Well, the reciprocal of a really, really big number should be a really, really small number. So we can write this as 1 plus c times 0. But c times 0 is 0, so we're going to get infinity times ln of 0, or ln of 1, sorry, and ln of 1 is 0. So we get a really, really big number times a really, really small number, and that's type B indeterminate. Since it's type B indeterminate, we have a rewrite strategy. And our rewriting strategy is to rewrite this as a single fraction. The trick now is, how do we do that? 
because in this particular problem, there's nobody who naturally belongs in the denominator. However, we can kind of use the same trick right here. This x, for example, could be written as 1 over x to the minus 1. So if I leave the ln part by itself, and I write x as essentially 1 over 1 over x, then we haven't changed the function any, we've just rewritten it in the form of a fraction. But now that it's in the form of a fraction, oh, let me erase that extra one in front before it confuses me, we can now go through the plug-in process again. If we were to go and plug in formally infinity, we're going to get ln of 1 plus c times infinity to the minus 1 over infinity to the minus 1. Now we spent a whole bunch of time showing that ln of c plus infinity to the minus 1 is 0. And the thing on the bottom is the reciprocal of infinity. Well, 1 over infinity, 1 over huge number, is a small number. So we're now going to get 0 over 0. And so by rewriting the type B indeterminate form, we've turned it into a type A indeterminate form. And type A indeterminate forms can be hit with the L'Hopital stick. So let's give it a thwack. We have the same limit here. We'll replace the top by the derivative of the top and the bottom by the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of ln of blank is 1 over blank. 1 over 1 plus c times x to the minus 1 times the derivative of blank. The derivative of this will be negative c times x to the minus 2. We also replace the bottom by the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the bottom is negative x to the minus 2. So there's our derivatives. Now let's simplify these things. It's worth noting that you have an x to the negative 2 in the top and the bottom, and so these guys cancel. You also have a negative 1 in the top and bottom, so they cancel as well. And so we can clean this up as the limit as x tends to infinity of, let's see, what do we have? There's only a 1 downstairs. Upstairs we have a c over 1 plus c times x to the minus 1. So there's the rewrite that L'Hopital's rule gives us. Now let's formally plug in infinity one more time. We're going to get c over 1 plus c times infinity to the minus 1. Well, we've already said repeatedly that infinity to the minus 1 is 0 as a determinant form. And so this gets me c over 1 plus c times 0, which is c over 1. And that's the real number c. Since this is a number, it means that this plug-in was justified, and tracing the equalities back, we see that the limit as x tends to infinity of x times ln of 1 plus c x to the minus 1 is the real number c. Keep this one in mind, because even though this was the indeterminate form 0 times infinity, we've shown that this particular limit could be any real value whatsoever. 0 times infinity doesn't have to be 0. Now let's look at this last example. The limit as x tends to 0, from the right, of 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus 1 over x. Now if we plug in 0, formally we're going to get 1 over 1 minus 1 minus 1 over 1, or, sorry, 1 over 0. This is going to get me 1 over 0 minus 1 over 0. Now we've said that 1 over 0 can be interpreted as you're taking 1 dividing by a really, really small value. So that should be plus or minus infinity. And then we're taking away 1 over 0, which is a plus or minus infinity. So if I pull that plus or minus out, we're getting plus or minus infinity minus infinity. And this piece right here is type B indeterminate. Since it's type B indeterminate, I know that I need to rewrite this as a single fraction. The trick is just going to be, how should I do that? Well, in this case, I have two smaller fractions. So I already have fractions lying around. If I want to make a single fraction out of them, let's just put them on a common denominator. I'll multiply the top and bottom of this by x, and the top and bottom of this one by e to the x minus 1. So I'll have a common denominator of x times e to the x minus 1. Upstairs, we're going to have x minus parentheses e to the x minus 1. And so now we've rewritten this as a single fraction. Once it's been rewritten as a single fraction, we can go through the plug-in process again. Formally plugging in, we're going to get 0 minus e to the 0 minus 1, all over 0 times e to the 0 minus 1. So upstairs, that's 0 minus 1 minus 1, 
On the bottom we have 0 times 0, and that's still 0 over 0. So this became type A indeterminate. And since it's type A indeterminate, we can hit it with the L'Hopital stick. So let's do that. We'll take this limit. We'll replace the numerator with the derivative of the numerator. So the derivative of the top is going to be 1 minus the derivative e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of minus 1 is 0. So 1 minus e to the x upstairs. On the bottom, I'm going to have to go and do the product rule. So it's the derivative of the first 1 times the second e to the x minus 1 plus the first x times the derivative of the second, which is e to the x. So let's clean these things up here. We always clean up after we do derivatives. So upstairs we're going to have 1 minus e to the x. Downstairs we're going to have e to the x minus 1 plus x e to the x. Ah, sadly nothing cancels. What are you going to do? So let's repeat the process. If we plug in x equals 0, we're going to get 1 minus e to the 0. Upstairs, downstairs we're going to have e to the 0 minus 1 plus 0 times e to the 0. So that's 1 minus 1 upstairs, which is 0. And downstairs we have 1 minus 1 plus 0 or 0 again. This is type A indeterminate. And so that means, once again, we can hit this with the L'Hopital stick. So we're going to have the limit as x tends to 0 from the right. Let's see. We'll replace the numerator, remember we're looking at this guy right here, with the derivative of the numerator. That's going to get me 0 minus e to the x. And we'll replace the denominator, this guy right here, with the derivative of the denominator. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the derivative of minus 1 is 0, and the derivative of x e to the x is going to involve the product rule again. It'll be the first derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second. So if I were to clean this up, I have the limit as x tends to 0 from the right, of negative e to the x upstairs, and on the bottom I have 2 e to the x plus x e to the x. Notice that every term has an e to the x in it, so this can be cancelled out from the limit. And I can simplify this as the limit as x tends to 0 from the right of negative 1 over 2 plus x. And that's a nice simplification. As x tends to 0, let's see, we'll formally plug in that. We're going to get negative 1 over 2 plus 0, or negative 1 half. Since negative 1 half is a real number, it means this last plug-in was justified. And so tracing back all of our equalities, we see that the original limit, the limit as x tends to 0 from the right of 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus 1 over x, is equal to negative 1 half. So here are three different type B indeterminate forms. What about the type C indeterminate forms? Those were the three indeterminate forms, 1 to the infinity, 0 to the 0, and infinity to the 0th power. How would we handle something like that? Well, the basic attack is the same for each of these three guys, which is why I lumped them together as type C's. And the basic attack is this. Prep it! What does that actually mean right here? Well, in a problem like this, the only way you're going to have 1 to the infinity, or 0 to the 0, or infinity to the 0, is if you're going to have a limit who looks something like this. You're going to have some function who's being raised to some other power. Now, the minute you have something like this, if you're thinking of this from a calculus point of view and you prep it, the fact that you have x's up in the exponential mean that this is really the, exponent in, the exponential function in disguise. This is the limit as x tends to a of e to the ln of f of x times g of x. This is just the conversion formula we use whenever we want to take derivatives of exponential functions. Now, here comes the cool part. The function e to the x, e to the something, is a continuous function. And continuous functions work well with limits. Whenever you have a continuous function, the limit can be slid inside the function. So instead of the limit being outside of e to the blah, we can bring the limit inside. And write this as e to the power of the limit as x tends to a of ln of f of x times g of x. Why is this a good attack? It's because this limit up here will always be type B indeterminate. And we've just talked about how to handle a type B indeterminate form. So 
We'll take a look at a couple of these examples, but it's worth sort of pointing out a summary of what we've just done right here. We have the two type A indeterminate forms, 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. And our basic tool is to hit them with the stick. We also have two type B indeterminate forms, infinity times 0 and infinity minus infinity. And our basic tool here is to rewrite them as a fraction. And by rewriting it as a fraction, the fraction will always be type A indeterminate. And so we can solve it by hitting it with the stick. Now what we've just seen is that for the three type C indeterminate forms, 1 to the infinity, 0 to the 0, and infinity to the 0, our basic rewrite is to prep it with an exponential function. And then when we move the limit up to the exponent, the result is that it will always be type B which we can then write as a fraction, convert it to type A, and hit it with the stick. So essentially, every limit we work on nowadays, we're going to hit it with the low tall stick. It just takes a little bit of time to get down to that form. Well, let's do some examples. Let's take a look at the limit as x tends to pi from the right of sine x to the x minus pi, and the limit as x tends to infinity of 1 plus 3 over x to the power of 2x. So let's focus on this guy first. This is the limit as x tends to pi from the right of the sine of x raised to the power of x minus pi. Now if I were simply to go and plug in pi directly, I'm going to get the sine of pi to the power of pi minus pi. So sine of pi, remember that's 0, and pi minus pi is the 0th power. So I get 0 to the 0, and that's one of my type C indeterminate forms. So my rewrite on a type C indeterminate form is simply to prep this thing. I'm going to write this as e to the power of ln of the base times the power x minus pi. That's my conversion formula. But since e is a continuous function, I can move the limit up top. And so this becomes e to the power of the limit as x tends to pi from the right of ln of sine of x times x minus pi. And now I'm going to focus my attention on just the limit in the exponent. Because the limit in the exponent is supposed to be type b. So let's take the limit as x tends to pi from the right of ln of sine of x times x minus pi. So if we directly plug in, we're going to get ln of the sine of pi times pi minus pi. Now obviously pi minus pi is 0. On the left hand side we have ln of the sine of pi which is ln of 0. Now remember that ln of 0 is not 1. ln of 1 is 0. 0 is the vertical asymptote of the logarithm. So as ln gets closer and closer to 0, ln of 0 gets closer and closer to the asymptote value. So we have negative infinity times 0. If you'd like, that's just negative infinity times 0, and that's type B indeterminant. It will always be type B indeterminant. That's a promise of this method. So because we're going to get type B indeterminant forms, that means I need to rewrite this thing as some kind of a fraction, a single fraction. Now it's not naturally written as a fraction right now, so I'm going to have to do one of these tricks where we take something and put it underneath the fraction bar. Since it worked last time, I'm going to leave the logarithm up top, ln of sine of x, but I'll take x minus pi, I'll put it below the fraction bar, but with a negative first power. If we formally plug in, we're going to get ln of the sine of pi upstairs, and we're going to get pi minus pi to the negative first power downstairs. Up top, that's ln of 0. Downstairs, that's 0 to the minus 1. We've seen that ln of 0 is negative infinity, and this is the reciprocal of 0, 1 over 0. Remember that whenever we have a number divided by 0, we said, as a determinant form, that that's either positive or negative infinity. It depends on the sign of the number. So I get a negative infinity over a positive or negative infinity. Notice that up to sign, what we're looking at is infinity over infinity, with either a positive or a negative in front of it. But infinity over infinity is type A. And by rewriting a type B as a fraction, we always get a type A. 
So since it's a type A, we can now hit it with the L'Hopital stick. So <laughs> let's hit it with the L'Hopital stick, see what we get. We're going to have the limit as x tends to pi from the right. The derivative of the top is going to be 1 over blank sine of x times the derivative of sine of x, which is cosine of x. On the bottom, we're going to have the derivative of x to minus pi to the minus 1 is negative x to the minus pi to the minus 2 times the derivative of x to the minus pi, or x minus pi, sorry, which is 1. Let's try to clean this bad boy up a little bit. Notice that these pieces that have a negative exponent really belong on the other side of the fraction bar. So these belong in the numerator, and this 1 over sine of x really belongs in the denominator. So if I simply clean this up a wee bit, we're going to have the limit as x tends to pi from the right. There's a negative down below, so it's negative sine of x in the denominator. And in the numerator, we're going to have the cosine of x times x minus pi to the second power. There's our brand new limit. If we formally plug in pi, we're going to get the cosine of pi times pi minus pi squared all over negative times the sine of pi. Well, since pi minus pi is 0, this is negative 1, this is 0, and this is 0, we're going to get 0 over 0, which is still type A indeterminate. And that means we can hit, once again, this limit whoopsh, with a loopy tall stick. So let me continue, let me give myself a little bit of free space right here. I'm going to move this guy up to here, and then clear everything below it, and now press on with L'Hopital's rule. So, we'll have the limit as x tends to pi from the right. We'll replace the top with the derivative of the top. Uh, that's not going to be much fun. We're going to have to use the product rule. So, it will be the derivative of the first piece, negative sine of x, times the second piece, x minus pi squared, plus the first piece, cosine of x, times the derivative of the second piece, which is 2 times x minus pi times 1, all over the derivative on the bottom, which is negative cosine of x. So if we clean this up, we have the limit as x tends to pi, from the right, of negative sine of x times x minus pi squared, plus 2 times the cosine of x, times x minus pi all over negative cosine of x. Now if we formally plug in pi one more time, we're going to get negative sine of pi times pi minus pi, which is 0 squared, plus 2 times the cosine of pi times pi minus pi, which is 0, all over negative cosine of pi. Remember that the sine of pi is 0 and the cosine of pi is negative 1. And so this is going to simplify to 0 in the numerator and negative negative 1 in the denominator. 0 over 1. After a long day of limits, you sometimes have to think really hard about that one. But 0 over 1 is the number 0. Since that's a real number, that means that this plug-in was justified. And so that means that this limit in purple is equal to 0. But remember, we're not done yet, because this wasn't the final answer. This was just this piece up here. So we've worked out that the limit up there is equal to 0. And so my original limit, the limit sine x to the power of x minus pi, is going to have a limiting value of e to the 0, which is 1. And so that's my answer. This limit right here is equal to 1. All right, now let's take a look at this one right here. The limit as x tends to infinity of 1 plus 3 over x to the power of 2x. Now if we formally plug in, we're going to get 1 plus 3 over infinity to the power of 2 times infinity. A number over infinity we've said is 0, and 2 times infinity is infinity. And so this is going to simplify to... 1 inside the parentheses raised to the infinity power. And 1 to the infinity is a type C indeterminate form. So the attack for a type C indeterminate form is to prep this as e to the power of ln of the base, ln of 1 plus 3 times x to the minus 1, I'm already prepping it, times the power 2x. 
And since e is a continuous function, that means we can move the limit up top and write this as e to the power of the limit as x tends to infinity of ln of 1 plus 3 times x to the minus 1 times 2 times x. And now all we have to do is focus our attention on the limit in the exponent. Now the limit in the exponent is the limit as x tends to infinity of, let's rewrite this as 2 times x times ln of 1 plus 3 times x to the minus 1. If we plug in x equals infinity, we're going to have 2 times infinity times ln of 1 plus 3 times infinity to the minus 1. Now 2 times infinity is obviously infinity. On the other hand, infinity to the minus 1, that's the reciprocal of infinity. That's not an indeterminate form, that's determinant, that's 0. And so we're getting inf infinity times an ln of 1, or an infinity times a 0. So this is, in fact, type B indeterminate. And so we could solve this by rewriting this guy as a fraction and going through the usual process. However, today I'm feeling a little bit lazy, and I just want to point out this. Focus on this bit for just a second. In the previous example, we worked out that the limit as x tends to infinity of x times ln of 1 plus c x to the minus 1 is always equal to c. So the expression in green right here matches that with c equals 3. So the expression in green should have a limiting value of 3. Of course, there's a 2 floating out in front. That 2 is just going to follow along the whole trip. And so we're going to get a limiting value of 2 times 3, or 6. You should go and double check this on your own. But I'm just feeling like, well, being a lazy guy. So the limit of 2 times x times ln of 1 plus 3x to the minus 1 is equal to 6. But remember, this isn't the final answer. This is only the value up here in the exponent. So what we can conclude is that the original limiting value is e to the sixth power. And so our limiting value here is e to the sixth power.